Uh, good evening. Uh, in a collection of speeches made at the memorial for Walter Rodney, titled, and finally, They Killed Him, which I prepared and edited for publication in 1985, I had the task of writing short bios on all the contributors to the volume. As on all such occasions, on that occasion, I faced the problem of being fair and equitable to all the contributors, regardless of their achievements, their relative fame, or lack thereof. However, the matter was remarkably simple when it came to writing a bio on Walesho Inca as one of the contributors to the volume. And I wrote quite simply, wishing I could have been in a position to do the same for all the contributors. I wrote, Wale Sho Inka is Wale Sho Inka. <laughs> and I moved on to the next person and the adverse task of writing paragraphs which would, be, which would adequately reflect that person's professional accomplishments and social persona. Well, since he is no stranger to Harvard, it is tempting, very tempting for me to do the same today to say quite simply, that as W.E.B. Du Bois was W.E.B. Du Bois, and Nelson Mandela was Man Nelson Mandela, so is Wale Shoinka, Wale Shoinka. Take my seat and let him take us along with him on the wondrous and provocative journey uh, of imagination and spirit, which is the idiosyncratic world of his essays in particular and all his writings in general. Well, but since I am now into my second paragraph in this introduction, it is obvious that I have elected to say more than that one sentence, five word bio. But I will say only a little more. And to be completely honest, that little more is mostly in anticipation of what this lecture this afternoon will be about, since I have missed the first two of the three lectures he was scheduled to, get, to deliver for the Cohen Lectures 217. I've been away out of the country, and I'm sorry I missed the first two lectures. That little more is simply to say that within and beyond the compass of the Nobel Prize in Literature and the wide, capacious space of more than 35 works that have been published, in that he has published in virtually all the literary genres, Shoinka has never failed to be thought-provoking and to jolt complacencies of intellectual, ideological, and moral pieties. And to do so in ways that often confuse and confound some of the individual and groups that one would normally regard as the natural allies of his political and ethical projects. I will give only two examples. He has been a scathing critic of the Euro-American literary, theatrical, and artistic avant-garde. In particular, that movement's self-indulgent excesses with regard to administering techniques and tactics of outrage and shock to readers and audiences. And secondly, he has been equally outspoken on what he considers the excesses of Western and African feminisms with regard to what might be called in the idiom of the discourse of political correctness, the effacement of ambiguity, of irony, and even of irreverence in matters and affairs between and within the sexes. So I confidently expect that, as the saying goes, some feathers will be ruffled today. I speak from experience in making this declaration, the experience of having been provoked and challenged on many, many occasions by showing us searing but eloquent, dramatic, and essayistic forest into crucial and perplexing areas of contemporary society to return to basics, to first principles. This, of course, requires a submission to the power, the wit, and the elegance of his characteristic or signature use of language 
but it is, it is of a critical and vigilant submission that I speak. And it is in the spirit of that kind of submission that I now call on our guest speaker, Walesho Inka, who is Walesho Inka, to deliver the third and final title of the Cohen 217 lectures from Ashwebi to NNNNN Wood. <laughs> Walesho Inka. Hello. Cabo. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> I have to decide which of these. Yes, this one. So, ah, glad we are coming to the end of this. <laughs> I once uh, hallucinated at Heathrow Airport Hotel. It was the Sofitel. The consequences of a flight cancellation that uh, imposed uh, an unscheduled 24-hour layover. Nothing for it but to chafe at the delay and submit myself to my boss, my slave driver, commonly known as the laptop. I hadn't meant to stay so long at it. Just a few hours, I thought, before I collapsed. But it turned out to be one of those compulsive occasions that went on nearly the whole day, so that I didn't emerge until early dusk. When I broke off, I was feeling quite drained. So, time for a recuperative stroll and a drink. Perhaps take the train to London, or whatever, in the remaining time. I stepped out of my room into the familiar long corridors and its uh, flat and clinical linear architecture, turned the corner and I was hit by an explosion of colors. Instinctively, I ducked back and raced back to my room just to get my bearings as I wasn't sure where I was, what day it was, in short, even who I was. The possibility that I was dead actually occurred to me at the time, and frankly, the sensation wasn't bad at all. <laughs> what had confronted my sight in brief, in that brief step uh, across, you know, up to the right angle, into the right hand corridor, was this goddesses in multicolored chiffon attires are taking over the corridor, intersecting and floating up and down the corridor somewhere grouped around the lift, known as elevators here, entering and exiting and swirling up all over the adjacent stairways down the stairs. The air had taken on an unaccustomed flavor, clouds of incense, and multi-textured smells assailed my nostrils. I checked my surrounding in the room. There was my suitcase, the coagulator remains of the espresso cup, my laptop, which I had just abandoned. I looked out of the window, all familiar sights. So I girded my loins, readied, and stepped out again. If goddesses had taken over, then Ogun was prepared to join them. When I arrived at that decisive corner, lo and behold, it all vanished. I'd been away from that first sighting for no longer than about 10 minutes. Where had they all gone? So I walked uh, slowly to, the, to where I had sighted them first, around the lift and stairs. Then I heard sounds. It was clear. They were clustering originally to descend, and they'd all gone. So sure enough, when I arrived at the lifts and the, uh, and the uh, stairways and looked over the railing, over onto the floor below, there they all were, milling around in their saris chatting in subdued voices. The landing below, plus uh, an open space, had been uh, turned into a reception room, a wedding. Of course. The scene below looked as if a rainbow had fragmented and its uh, pieces had glided down below. Seated at, the, at one end of the room, presiding over the proceedings, was a Hindu deity, whom I easily recognized. Ganeshi, 
of the elephant head. At last, I could breathe normally. The regular hotel clientele were stood at district corners, sat at the bar, entranced. All travel, boredom, and weariness suddenly forgotten. It's just the break I needed, an unintended Philip to my flagging energy. So I remained on that hanging corridor and indulged in a panoramic view of the ceremony for an hour and then, suitably energized, returned to my room in my laptop. This hardly needs observing, but perhaps we should state it anyway, just to make sure that it's not lost. It has nothing to do with whether one embraces or rejects uh, the mythology from which a cultural practice has stemmed. If that were the case, millions of, uh, from diverse religions would, and races would not flock to admire shrines of the, Japanese, of the Japanese Shinto gods, the massive statues of Buddha and his temples, the Notre Dame, or the horizon of minarets that crown the Muslim horizon from Marrakesh to Chechnya and even Italy, home of the Roman Catholic Vatican. We do not need to be partisans of the extravagant geography of love to admire the Taj Mahal any more than turn Irish in order to partake of the feast of St. Patrick that turns even fountains green in the United States. Then I had a good laugh at myself, too, as a matter of fact. One, of course, to have actually believed that I was hallucinating, but that was understandable. The second laugh had a history. Of course, I'd witnessed similar scenes at home. A wedding without Ashwebi is simply not a wedding. Unthinkable. But they used to irritate me in no end. Far too ostentatious most of the time, I feel. I'm afraid my temperament instinctively recoils from such assemblage, especially as it runs rampant on the wings of uh, extravagance. Many use it as an instrument of exclusion. They ensure that they select material whose price is beyond what they constitute their class, the class situation of the ones to be excluded could afford. The weddings uh, now even employ makeup specialists, sometimes flown in when the wedding is taking place outside the borders. There's no question regarding their expertise. They are truly professional. By the time they're finished, all the faces look virtually the same. The favorite target appears to be a sort of image of, or a mask of a, a Japanese lady. What that signifies, I don't really know. But perhaps one should find it a bit bothersome. If the basic motif is the geisha loop, then my wife has attended her last wedding ceremony. Seriously, though, a subtle problematic is being inserted into the arena of human adornment in of the Nigerian scene, which always leads in many uh, aspects of social conduct. A problem problematic is truly fascinating, complicated. It is gratifying because uh, the women evidently place some serious attention Tension, some serious question marks on what it means to be feminine. How to be feminine without, however, losing ground to male dictation. Yamio Shurunga is all very well, they seem to say. Mr. W.S. can uh, pontificate as much as he wants on the female power exercised through the Gelede. External pressures, groups may even turn patronizing, as they often do, over what they consider a betrayal of the female absolute, which is feminist, along a certain definition, of course. What is undeniable is that the Yoruba woman, in particular, has chosen how to empower herself, selecting and creating from internal options within their own community of self-conscious and self-confident females. And there is justification for this in the phenomenal rise of women in all social directions, certainly in many parts, most parts today, in fact, of Nigeria. 
entrepreneurship, the arts, including the performan, uh, performance arts, politics, including powerful positions in governance. Even in that specialized yet prevalent discipline and business known as corruption. It's quite a quantum leap to consider how many top-notch professional women have one leg dangling over the prison gates at home. Some are in exile for very good reasons. The Ashwebi and the Gili explosion have brought us to these musings. Before, and before we depart from them, let it be retained in our minds that the Ashwebi, which means literally family attire, is really a bonding mechanism built around a social aesthetic plinth. It signifies that not merely the family or the extended family, but the entire community is declaring on the day of the big event and including activities that lead up to that day that they are all one of the same family, the family of the celebrant. And for that reason, the women and men also in increasing numbers ask in advance for the apportionment of the material that will be worn by the family. They contribute to a common purse, which of course reduces costs in some cases, and they turn up on that day in uniform regalia. Ashwebi is uniquely Yoruba, but it is increasingly copied by others, even outside the nation. In this department of dressing up for an uh, occasion, there is an obvious contrast between, let us, between cultures, let us say between the European American and the African, the Yoruba especially. Farce to violent uh, confrontations are stock in trade in much of European and American films, where two women meet at a function, and one or both bursts into tears, or turn around and dash back home because they discover they are wearing identical dresses. I confess I couldn't tell whether the Indian wedding party at Sofitel was propelled more by difference than identity. In my condition, I must confess, all the saris blended together multicolored, multi-textured, but united by that distinctive sari design and its physical regulation on the body. Among the Yoruba, the basic principle is to reduce difference and establish solidarity, to the, um, reduce difference to the barest minimum and establish solidarity. That minimum, of course, being most conspicuously in the style of the head wrap. In other words, the entire body, the smock and the wrapper, even the gil, uh, the ibon, the, the sash, will all be the same. But when it comes to the gili, what I've noticed is that it becomes more extravagantly different. And this incre incredibly has given rise to one of the most remarkable innovations seen in Nigerian fashion in recent years, spearheaded by a multi-talented artist and batik maker known as, uh, called uh, Nike Ekundayo. I suspect that she invents a new style every day. Indeed, there's no question that she has created a totally new aesthetic. I peeped into her workshops occasionally and actually been present at some of her headgear parades. What can be done with a piece of tissue is simply amazing. The intricacies of winding uh, are a study in fluid action. She's done demonstrations in Europe and the Caribbean. And this is one of those uh, undeniable instances of the evolution of a virtually new organism from a tradition. And as usual, one that can be turned into a reinforcement of positive social usage or the opposite, what we've already described as ostentation. The negative propensities that would still qualify for an aesthetic, but a distinctly negative one. Nigerian famous or infamous exhibitionism, even gaudily class conscious aesthetic pretensions. It is that latter option 
which the N. Wood film industry has largely fastened upon. Though, of course, there are exciting exceptions. Indeed, a totally new generation is fast abandoning, excuse me, is fa um, fast abandoning what in the US, for instance, used to be known as a black, black exploitation. Tradition for many of these new enthusiasts means virtually the equivalent of the ancient Hollywood Tarzan mumbo jumbo that passed for the image of the African traditional healers. All feathers and leather and gold rattling and clumsy special effects today used lavishly, often without rhyme or reason. The conflation of what I described yesterday as simply cultic demonism with no shred whatsoever of the sacred in what we understand as a religious or solemn ritual. But then, as we say in Yoruba, one yamuku, erue my war, only ati saleloti war. Means you tell the knock kneed um, carrier that his uh, load, the load on his head is unbalanced. He will tell you the problem began from below, right at the base. Point, don't expect a straight growth, a straight shoot, if you begin with something askew. Let the N-word serve us as a lesson on the neglect, on the neglect of some basic traditional principles of creativity. In uh, revealing himself a dyslexic, the American writer Richard Ford qualified this by explaining that he actually sees words as images. No, I wouldn't make such a far out claim for myself. However, I do subscribe to the view that words do have shapes which are in turn evocative of more than the mere sound or spelling of the words or their literal meaning. Indeed, one can claim that some images become eventually attached to words with such intimacy that they can no longer be prized apart, even if that's not, it's not the image which they express to begin with, but I appear to be getting closer and closer to Richard Ford's uh, position. So let's just simply say, try and sum it up thus, that the power of suggestion goes beyond mere suggestion. A word can distort the palpable reality that one's own senses have already determined. Where such a word is then deployed as a sum or part of values, as a category of phenomena, even as a loose umbrella for a family of products, it can distort other entities under that umbrella completely, influencing the seizure of such products in our minds. Where we are concerned with uh, creative activity, the word can contract the scope or reduce the quality within the overall meaning. In short, a word can inhibit or expand imagination. It can prove a curse or a blessing. Regarding the creative process, let it be understood that I'm not necessarily speaking of originality. This came up yesterday, and I just want to expand a little on it. I read critiques of artistic works that appear to make originality the benchmark of creativity, blindly dismissing such a work on the grounds that it is not original. Some masterful works in all genres have been produced that are based on deliberate imitativeness or plagiarism, if you want. There are different kinds of plagiarism even. Some can actually emerge as a new product of its kind, a kind of creative provocation or a commentary on the original, sometimes a slate of expectations or attribution, what is sometimes called signification, especially in American literary discourse. So we're not speaking here of originality. Christianity, for instance, is a textual, elaborate plagiarization of the ancient pagan rites of winter 
and spring and their liturgies reinforced by historical events, all of which now constitute the scriptures known as the Bible. Islam advances the process a step further. Its scriptures, the Quran, certainly one of the most inspired cases of sublime plagiarism the world has ever known. But see the millions of followers who treat each of those two scriptures as divine originals, deviation from which would be unthinkable and even in some cases considered blasphemous, punishable by death. This should be sufficient to make a case for the claim that Godhead speaks to mankind in different textualities. Alas, humanity has failed to advance to that simple and logical deduction. All that, by the way, the digression perhaps predictable in one form or the other, thanks to the fact that we all are living in a time when the figures, the casualty figures, contributed to the general mayhem of the world by religion, have reached heights at which the mind literally boggles. In truth, however, that is until recently, I've been far more consistently exercised by the conundrum of what actually unites humanity, or expressed differently, what actually separates humanity from the rest of the living species. Nothing mysterious at all. It ends up, in my estimation, my conceiving, as simply culture. I've also learned to invoke that word with an S, cultures, at the end of it. Every community appears to be united around a conglomerate of observances and usages that are the designated culture. Even where little understand, you will find that differentiation of one community from another often evokes such expressions as, this is not our culture, just next door neighbors, even families. Our culture has been bastardized, compromised, superseded, etc., etc. You cannot come here and try and impose your culture on us. It is foreign culture that is destroying our youth, etc., etc. Hardly without some sort of justifying basis, but also just as confidently imprecise, selective. Certainly less precise, more accommodating than saying, this is not our history. History tends to be far more precise, which would, of course, enable us to contest any such assertion based on memory, documentation, even geography. When it comes to culture, however, the problem becomes increasingly difficult. If we are settled on a hillside where there is extant proof that 50, even 100 years ago, we were settled in the valley, then we are, of course, in the territory of geography, coming to the end of history. Now, you try proposing that building a new settlement on that mushy hillside is dangerous. Somebody will get up and tell you, go away. This is where our people's culture was established, and this is where we're going to build this uh, dwelling. Now, let me invoke culture as a critical input and even modern artistic adventure. Culture places a heavy premium on, for instance, child naming. The child is father of the man, says the poet William Wordsworth. We can add, however, that for African societies, the name is father of the child. Such careful thought, sense of history, hopes, and expectations ride on the name that we give to a new human entity we are brought into the world. Child naming on the continent is itself a creative act. Quite recently, the following uh, observation appeared in the Nigerian Journal. I think it was The Nation. On the back page, uh, weekly column, uh, uh, title, comment and debate, etc., etc. Anyway, here's the extract. Naming in Africa, especially in Yoruba land, is a special gift that the ancestors and progenitors of the nation bestowed on the elders. Names have meaning. And as they would have us believe, names push their bearers to actualize their encoded meanings. Uruko, Ama, Romo, literally, the name may mold the child. So you don't find any Yoruba parent giving to their babies 
names that embed evil meanings. Now, did the naming affect, or was it completely indifferent to the first wave of films that came out of Nigeria and parts of West, other parts of West Africa? My mind goes straight to contrasts, especially since that was not the pioneer film movement on the continent. That honor goes decisively to, the, to Senegalese film makers. I still recall, if I may, the first Negro Arts Festival in Dakar, which marked the formal outing of contemporary African cinema, even as a rudimentary exploration of the genre. Yes, some of the products were decidedly amateurish, but they were already, already bore the stamp of genuine exploratory minds at work, interrogating the new medium. Even the clumsiest was refreshing, and of course, the more skilled were inspiring. My memory were not so cluttered, I would reel off a few names, but I do recall the young Jibril Diop, and I think Usman Sissoko from Mali. What remains fresh in my mind are snippets of scenes, such as uh, the satiric uh, use of the tro tro, the traditional uh, uh, public transport, rickety, often uh, with fatalities guaranteed in advance. And he was using, he used that, uh, that familiar community transport to ridicule the pretensions of a figure of the European black sophisticate, a species that we know in Nigeria as Johnny just come, or Adyabota. Adyabota means wind on butter, instead of palm oil. This figure of fun considered himself unfortunate to be compelled to ride in the same conveyance as peasants, workers, and other uneducated beings. It was a simple but hilarious film, I recall, that introduced the viewer to the makeshift existence of semi-urbanized life, a picaresque work filled with incidents along a journey that covered the gamut of daily survival and challenges, inducing the passengers of the Trotro transportation into a transient community. Our principal, played by the, our principal, played by the young Diop himself, was reduced, coattails and all, uh, in that suffocating Sahelian heat, to push the Trotro when it broke down. It was, as I said, satirical, instructive, but definitely entertaining. Don't ask me why I recall that scene so vividly after so many decades, but I, I wish that the young aspirants to the cinema trade today would have the opportunity to watch such films, if only as a basic lesson of extracting a film nearly out of nothing on what must have been a shoestring budget, literally, bringing reality to life without the ponderous um, injection of excess craftiness. Beginnings, beginnings can be very instructive. And we're talking about beginnings in the 60s, especially beginnings that are deceptively artless. The strike at recognizable truths without the cluttering of overlabeled techniques. And perhaps at the back of my mind was recollection of one of my all-time favorites uh, of general, in the general film industry, Fellini's La Strada, with the unforgettable performance of Giletta Messina in the archetypal role of the tragic clown. I'm not making the same claims of accomplishment for both, by no means. They're both variations on the same theme, the many faces of the road, one of, as you know, my favorite uh, uh, foraging ground, admittedly. And there the comparison ends. What matters was that both films emerged out of, out of specific environments even though they were variations on the same central motif. And there, of course, was the already socially dedicated hand of Usman Sembene, who grew in self-assurance, as he tackled increasingly demanding historical and contemporary social themes. One and all gathered in Dakar, brimming with confidence in multiple disciplines, churning magma of artistic forces of a post-independence generation. It is evi it's evidently too late now to appeal to those who have embraced, yes, we now come close to the N-word, daring myself to utter it, yes. Those nationals who have fallen for the hackneyed shortcut to their own naming ceremonies, even more thankless than preaching to the converted, I'm afraid, is preaching against the converted. 
When so much time has passed and the habit has become ingrained, with what forces of persuasion can one master to undo that mind? As you say in Yoruba, if the leaf wrapping of soap, black soap, sticks too long to the leaves, then even the leaves themselves become part of the soap. So peace upon all those whose sensibilities I may have intruded upon, but this drawn out exposition is not really addressed to them as such. It's rather to the simple entry, is, is rather a simple entreaty to those who have not yet succumbed to the lure of the soap and leaf. To them all I plead, imagine if the then putative film venture that made its organized debut in Dakar in 1966 had been lumbered with the name Dollywood for Dakar. Every ensuing product is already doomed in the mind with its associated baggage of infantilism, even before its exposure. Now just imagine the annunciation of a Dollywood film festival, or a, perhaps Sellywood for Senegal. If I seem to stress, and this is quite deliberate, to pay attention to the film industry, the art of the film, it's because I do believe from all evidence that the cinema is actually the art medium of the future. If only it stopped a subjective revulsion. However, there are more provocation, uh, provo provocative questions, such as does the branding influence the product? If you give a product a deleterious name, does it affect in advance the consciousness of future producers? If on the other hand, a propulsive challenging name, one that even intimates more than it presently is, would that perhaps provoke in the artist a tendency towards adventurousness, experimentation, and originality? The arguments that I have posed suggest that it is a light case. Or are we merely indulging in self-flagellation? If the pioneers of 1966 had grouped themselves around the formulation Dollywood, would we have produced today's Suleiman Sise, Ola Balogun, Kola Olaniyo, Belo, and the rising generation of cineasts? Consider this, following the mentality of the base of, uh, of uh, Pespaco, because based in Burkina Faso, would that be Bullywood? Or perhaps, since this is uh, too close to Hollywood, shall we just say it would be Sullywood, or Bellywood? Try and think, just one more, of any more ghastly, more gallish name than the contribution from Ghana, Gollywood. Why not go all the way and call it Gollywog? Well, you know where it all started. However, do the emerging Nigerian new breed still deserve to be associated without commencing second-hand clothes market tag or with an evolving designer cut production catering not for the lowest common denominator in taste but for more discerning audiences and or raising unsurprising expectations even within their limited scope of technical expertise. Even a casual study of current film making indicates that the Nigerian film occupation is rapidly bypassing the stage of such retarded mimicry. Why should the films of such artists continue to be classified under that unprepossessing monstrosity of a verbal shroud known as, here it comes at last, Nollywood? How do we extricate both for internal and external references, including potential markets and consumers, the grain from the chaff, the silkworm from the pupae. See what the Indian film industry has churned out so prodigiously in quantity since it succumbed to the perverse name of Bollywood. Thousands of films emerged mired in the same Bollywood mush. It took a Satya Rai to plot a truly original path through the morass 
with his masterful Pata Panchali, the first of a trilogy of ordinary lives that opened the eyes of viewers to the vast world of mundane rhythms, East and West Africa. See what toll this has taken in the conditioning of audiences, audience tastes, expanding, that is from India, to Southern and West Africa. You must point out, however, that there may be a correlation between the product and the environment that brings the product to life in the first instance. Each phenomenon of naming is not unrelated to the social space of that naming ceremony. The social, political, business, religious, indeed the entire interactive environment of a country like Nigeria, the birthland of that Nollywood, unpredictable, raucous, egotistical, callous, sentimental, irrational, and pugnacious, all at one and the same time. The manifestations that make up Nigerian reality today are so grossly improbable that it sometimes appears to, me, appears to me that all you have to do is set up a camera in an office, in a market, in the motor park, or indeed any street corner, go away for lunch, and return several hours later, and voila, a film has already been made, ready for marketing. <laughs> Bit of editing here and there, you know, just to, but virtually ready for release. Actually, that method is not too far from the truthful beginnings of that thing called Nollywood. It's a question of a director just getting two or three of his friends and saying to one, slap her. And then he said, you slap her back. All right, now scream. All right, now I run out, half dressed. All right, take, print, all right, next scene. That actually is a story of the beginning of Nollywood uh, film industry. Indeed, the very material grossness of something like Nigerian life does create a tendency to reach out towards improbabilities. Nigerian social actualities of such a nature that the filmmaker's creative mind feels a compulsion to top it with excesses in order to satisfy the demands of novelty. In other words, life around the contemporary filmmaker where the grossest excesses take place every day but are treated like the norm, forces imagination to reach outside and beyond reality to convince itself that it is at work, that it is not merely imitating reality. Everything is oversized in the birthplace of Nollywood. Oversized consumption, oversized class distinction, oversized exhibitionism, oversized egos, oversized superstition, oversized dehumanization, Oversized corruption, oversized inflation, both human and economic, oversized national real estate, oversized pugnacity, oversized garbage heaps, oversized decay, oversized media, oversized foreign investment, oversized churches, and oversized mosques, oversized consumerism by an oversized elite, even oversized first ladies, sometimes with oversized vulgarity, oversized rapacity, avariciousness, and overreachousness. You won't find that word in the dictionary. But I happen to <coughs> excuse me. I have something earlier. Sorry, <coughs> just trying to cope with a cold that threatens to be oversized. <laughs> Yes, I was saying you won't find that word in the dictionary, but as I say, I come from the land of Nollywood, where if any expression is outside your non-existence vocabulary, you just have to make it up. You have the licensing. <laughs> as a dramatist, I think I can actually sympathize with the artistic temperament uh, representation that goes after the grossest aspects of the environment with a share of a size productivity at the expense of quality. After all, when I wanted to capture the sheer brutishness of existence under one of our most notorious dictators, did I not reach for the theater of the absurd? <coughs> In uh, Alfred Jarry's uh, Uburoi, I proceeded quite deliberately to try and top the already grotesque excesses of Jarry's adaptation 
in my creation of King Babu. Reality could no longer su suffice. The same creative process probably affected those early video lords. The Nigerian creative mind opens his newspaper day after day and look at the lurid he headlines that confront, that confront him. Ritual is caught with fresh human heads. Body of one month old baby with missing vital organs. Mother in custody. Kidnappers invade church, abduct officiating priest. Boko Haram kills seven health aid workers. Boko Haram abducts seven construction workers. 27 bodies washed ashore on the banks of the River Benue. Prophet arrested with five human heads and a baby fetus, and so on and so on. These are not made up headlines, in, as might appear. So when the filmmaker goes for the horror genre, where the staple news is that the local chief is cooking up his subjects piecemeal in order to make millions or win a local government election, let us not blame the industry, whatever name it goes by. However, the preparation was already there in the naming ceremony. An inclination towards um, accommodating foreign models of the sensationalist then follows, faced by such gargantuan proportions of societal reality begging for expression. And where is this to be found but in the ready-made formula of cheap Hollywood? cheapness, calls to cheapness, where what are generally valued as social assets, and this includes human life itself, are held so cheaply, the artist may consider it beneath him or her to expend more than the cheapest representational responses. The precedence, the precedence is not lacking. The early contemporary African-American black directors, etc., cetera, rode to cinema prominence on the shoulders, in case we've all forgotten of what came to be known and described as black exploitation. Move, movies that exploited blackness, albeit in a stereotyped and imitative genre, substituting black actors for grade B white actors, black environment for white, but catering equally to what was considered lotus, etc., etc. All that considered. The objective view of art does not exclude transformation. And by that, I do not mean simply societal transformation. Indeed, you may have observed that I do not say the objective of art is also, among other purposes, transformation. But definitely, no one will deny that it surely includes revelation. Whether revelation leads to transformation or not is a different matter. But the primary objective of art is to constantly transform itself, at least, its own modes of expression and representation. The objective of art is also to be chameleonic and protean, that is, to change shape and color at will, to supersede both reality and expectations. Yes, indeed, the goal of transformation is not only desirable, it's an integrated element of what art does. We do not want to get bogged down with the um, ancient, ragged discourse based on a one-track reductionist relationship of art to society, what the artist's obligation is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Writers have put themselves through ringers, especially during the phase of ideological self-bashing that all societies undergo, especially liberating themselves, and in particular societies that have been victim of external, the external imperatives including their own cultural degradation from those external forces. Filmmakers should please understand that this discourse is daily overtaken by events, and we should now primarily interest ourselves in how the cineast, the new medium, transforms the material at his or her disposal. What applies to the writer, painter, musician, sculptor, even architect, is just as pertinent as what is pertinent to the filmmaker. And there's a grave danger, which is why I decided to end this series with this appeal to the filmmaker. 
the filmmaker must please save us from the lowest common denominator taking over that industry, just as it seems to have taken over the so-called social medium. When you open the social medium, you find cretins. Half of those cretins, and I don't care who wants to dispute it, come from Nigeria. <laughs> Nonetheless, we must acknowledge that there is a kind of magic immediacy that is more applicable to the cinema than to the other forms of expression, including even theater. And I concede that. Cinema is such a powerful tool for transformation. No question at all about that. However, just as in literature, the cinema can easily become a medium of crude propaganda that is totally devoid of artistic solace, blaring out an ideological line as a substitute for creative rigor. That is not what I'm preaching. Art is its own rigorous master. It makes demands, and the primary responsibility of the artist is to fulfill those internal demands. This, for instance, is what makes Sembene Usman a cineast of great versatility, one of the most consistent that the continent has produced. His ability to embed a social message in a work without sacrificing its artistic vision. I've singled out Sembene deliberately because the same kind of artistic integrity is apparent in his writings, such as God's Bits of Wood, for instance, as in his films, Chedo or Kala. Fantasy is, of course, a different matter. I'm not condemning fantasy, no. Each time I see new coverage of uh, my long queues winding around the cinema theater where a new Harry Potter book is being launched, and the same endless queues when the next Potter film is due to open, grandparents, parents, children of all ages, I fantasize about meeting Madame Multibillionaire Rawlings in a dark alley where there are no witnesses. As that opportunity, however, became less and less likely, I actually began to think seriously of matching skills against hers. But based, on, uh, but based this time on our own African mythological resources, Needless to say, the very first step of any creative idea is always the easiest part, which is to think to oneself, mm -hmm, that seems to be an interesting idea. And the second step forward, of course, mm -hmm, yep, that is a very good idea. And the third, of course, etc. wait a minute, this is a brilliant creative idea. After that, other distractions intervene, and a dead end looms in view. And one has to appeal to others that this material is there. You are the seniors, please use it. Why should a Bambara or a Corsa equivalent of Harry Potter series not also take the world by storm? So if anyone has any good idea on the subject, but without the Hollywood stamp, please let me announce right away that I'm open to any proposition. All the above considered, let's just remind ourselves that art does not exclude transformation. I want to make sure that I'm not misunderstood. Societal transformation, yes. And you may have observed that I do not say that it's the duty of art to transform. No, I simply say that it is the responsibility of art <clears throat> to be true to itself in adopting all the material at its disposal. Ugly, elevating, no matter what. The object, the objective, I beg your pardon, of art is also, among others, revelation. Whether revelation leads to transformation or not is a different issue. The primary objective is to constantly transform itself, its own modes of expression and representation. Its objective is also to be, as I said, protean. That is, to change shape and color at will, to supersede both reality and expectations. Yes, indeed, the goal of transformation is not only desirable, it is an integrated element of what art can do. We do not want us to get down bogged with uh, any, um, uh, any compulsive uh, diktat from ideologues. No, 
that will only cripple, we know, imagination. <clears throat> Writers, we know, have put themselves to the ringer. It is, I suspect, the turn of cineasts when new equipment, including drone cameras and recorders, are being manufactured every day and are at the disposal of our young cineasts. It is on account of that explosion, that techno uh, technological explosion, that I feel it is time that we addressed the seniors the same way as we've addressed the painter, the writer, the musician, the sculptor, even architect, as the potential pointer for social and human development. I believe it is the turn of the seniors. It applies to the Gilly artist, to the landscape transformer, and all have the option of quarrying into our traditional resources and transforming them, extracting from them new forms which they offer and which they do not even offer, new cohering organisms coming out of that exploration. So let me end with one of my favorite examples, this time uh, from Brazil. I don't know how many of you have ever been to El Salvador to see the floating deities on an artificial lake whose name uh, I do not remember now. The African deities have set sail from Africa. The interpretation of this phenomenon, this floating pantheon on this lake, is something which is both aesthetically satisfying and very moving. As I said, interpretations may differ. The purists may argue. But when you see what the deities, the very presence of them, the re artistic representation of them has done to that environment, I assure you, you will not cavil. We cannot help but end with our favorite mantra. Not just go to the Orisha this time, but return to the Orisha and create. Thank you. Yeah, one or two, yes, please. First of all, thank you very much for, for your talk. It was very inspiring. I was very interested when you were talking about the role that the arts can play to ignite uh, more revolution, social consciousness, uh, this feeling within the community to, to start uh, to change their, their environment, to uh, be more conscious ab about the inequalities and power structures happening in society. Um, I was wondering how do you see that could happen nowadays in, in different contexts in the world? Uh, we, which kind of uh, medium and, and expressions can, can the arts play uh, nowadays to, to be able to do that? And particularly taking into account how uh, art nowadays um, is a little bit limited by the freedom of expression that is um, control and censored by different governments, uh, by different entities, and, and how can art circumvent that? Mm -hmm. Thank you well, very much. I've, I've mentioned one uh, example uh, already, you know, the landscape uh, alteration, which in turn, of course, generates more ideas among people. You know, I can imagine the number of people who go, who see, who will encounter that artificial lake I'm talking about, where finally, in a public manner, the, um, the, the deities, a new symbol of expression, of recognition, has been accepted as part of the Brazilian landscape. There's something similar in, uh, in um, Brasilia, for instance. But the one in Brasilia is more enclosed. Uh, all the deities are supposed to be represented. I cannot say that I particularly admire the sculptor. They are all naturalistic. Uh, issue sits 
of the center, you know, all the other deities pay in obeisance. Um, but at least it's, it's, it's a garden uh, which is visited by many uh, uh, tourists, by tourists as well as by people of Brasilia. The, I single out the one in, uh, in El Salvador on this lake simply because of its impact. It's expect, totally unexpected. And there you are. You see these deities, of course, in, not, not in African dress. That doesn't matter in the slatter, you know. But the symbols are there. Shango, for instance, with the one. And there is this beautiful thing just floating. It doesn't matter. And that's why I cited that um, um, Indian wedding. It doesn't matter whether you believe in the Orisha or not. But there's no way any human being with an aesthetic sensibility cannot be moved and inspired by that size, that some organism which has sprung up in there. It's not a new process. It's uh, that transformation you're talking about, that adaptation, even exploitation of African symbols and myths have been expressed by writers. Abdias, whom I mentioned yesterday, in theater, Pepe Carrillo, uh, Nicolas uh, de Guedas Cuba, uh, has also used, I'm talking about the diaspora generally now, uh, has utilized some of these uh, uh, elements in his uh, poetry, uh, dramatic forms, dance forms. I once watched a, a dance in, um, uh, it was called the bamboo dance. Very skilled, very precise, and obviously it was something borrowed from Africa, which I had never seen. I had to see it in Brazil. Um, the, then, just quickly to touch on um, the cuisine, look at Akaraje, for instance, which is a Yoruba uh, uh, delicacy made from bean cake. And it, the effect, the, the role which, and the controversy and the struggle which took place during the World Cup over Akaraje is not to be underestimated. Because the burger, the burger makers, you know, hamburger makers, wanted them off the streets because they were very popular and uh, very rich, tastier, you know. And it rivaled Akaraje sometimes put inside buns, just like a hamburger. And nobody who's tasted Akaraje will go back to hamburger. I don't give a doubt what anybody <laughs> said. So they tried to get the government to drive them off the streets, and a really big fight took place. This is how social transformation took place through cultural retentions. Many, many parts. Music, the same thing. It's there. We were, sorry, uh, during, we tried very hard to bring, for instance, an opera to Lagos last year, which is based on uh, an African theme, a returnee slave. And unfortunately, during that time, they also began to get their tests. Oh, I don't know who influenced who, but a huge corruption signal, and the government sort of was in a turmoil. And even the rehearsals of that opera, which I looked forward so much to bringing over to Nigeria, just flopped. But people should keep trying. I just, I just uh, finished uh, writing a paper titled Dalit Cinema, which is the Dalit represents the former untouchables of India, and, and about the representation of the subjectivities. Uh, so, for example, in Bollywood, uh, there is a privileging of subjects as to what to present and what not to present. Where is the, sorry, hold on, David. Yeah. <laughs> I think my something has popped. <laughs> yeah, just listen. So, so you talked about the oversizing, uh, and, and you gave all those. So I was also wondering, what is the undersizing? What, what is not there uh, in, 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 uh, in this cellulite kind of sphere? Yeah. You, could you, yeah. He's referencing Indian movies mm -hmm. and the under-representation mm -hmm. of Dalits. Uh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and, and your question was, what? Uh, so he talked about the oversizing. He gave us all the oversizing. Yeah, he he, he mm -hmm. talked about vulgarity, ego, and all the right. Uh, but what are the undersizing effects? Maybe what is what is it like in Nigerian yeah, movies? Yeah, in, in his what, reference, what, what, is what is are the undersizing effects in Nollywood? Well, mm. yeah. Well, the way <laughs> the 
uh, cyberspace is being used, for instance, as I said, by, uh, I think they call them trolls uh, in cyberspace now. The same thing, if we're not careful, is going to happen with the film industry. When films, cheaply made films, uh, not just the, even below shoestring budget, can be made at a, you know, in a trice. And you can have that taken over by those who do not give a damn about quality, meaning, significance. They just want to paste it on there. Some of that is being done. I believe there is a channel where individuals can just send their clips, um, short documentary, and so on. A channel like that should be opened. I think it would be a very good idea. But then, um, I'm not for censorship, but I'm for quarantine. You know, <laughs> quarantine effect. You know, it should be open for them. I can do whatever they want over there. Um, it's rather like going back to Sweden. Sweden, at one time, when it thought it was being progressive, actually opened a park. Some of you may remember where you were free to go, but at your own risk. You can kick each other to death. You can smoke yourself to death. You can inject yourself to death. It was a park. It was unbelievable. And I think they realized that this was a little bit over the top, and they had to close it down. But something like that. It's less harmless on the uh, internet. But it's also, you see, this technology is an opportunity. This technology is something which is a partner with the, a natural partner with the arts. It's just a pity that we cannot decide, we cannot do in advance who controls it. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, in, the, in these lectures, you, you talk a lot about Brazil, and I'm Brazilian, and I, wa I want to understand more about your relationship with uh, Abidias do, Abidias do Nascimento. Just mm -hmm. wanted to know more about your relationship to Abidias. Oh, Abidias. Abidias is my elder brother. Well, still is. Um, uh, in fact, I brought him to Ife for when I was uh, teaching there. For he and... Uh, Eliza, Eliza, and the stay for some time. Actually, we did down his plays, uh, down his ex exhibition. Remember, he fought not only against racism, he fought against dictatorship in Brazil and was uh, exiled for some time in, I think, in Chicago, where he started um, a revolutionary theater. So I found him, uh, and very mischievous, very, very mischievous. Um, Abdias was not above. Um, actually, <laughs> having one on his uh, audience, he was. I, wa I watched him at work one day when he was haranguing the assembly in Brazil, and he finished, he lambasted them. But then he became a member, a, a senator, yeah. but he wasn't giving up his role. He lambasted them, uh, accused them, as he always did, of uh, attempting racial genocide by proposing that Brazilians were only one race, et cetera, et cetera. And it went on for a long time. And then he saw me where I was sitting, he looked at me and, <laughs> and he went aside. I loved him for that. <laughs> um, just to, um, this is not so much a question as a, a comment, to actually observe that what you called for uh, actually has begun to happen within Nollywood and the other African countries uh, video film industry. That's a different, an internal differentiation. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of talent, new talent. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. what's actually not happening is that the oversaturation of the meretricious of the very bad quantities by the marketplace of you know, internet circulation, how to, con how to work against that? That's the problem we face now. Mm -hmm. I've been astonished by the number of, um, I've actually lost count of the number of new talents that are beginning to use the video film mm -hmm. format yeah. for extraordinarily, you know, I mean, brilliantly made films. Mm -hmm. But they don't get circulated. Mm -hmm. They simply are lost in the overwhelming, what you call the oversaturation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's a complete, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sat you know, um, so I think that's what, and this is where mm -hmm. the institutions may play a role by intervening in the marketplace mm -hmm. to actually draw attention 
and salvage these new talents who are otherwise completely swamped. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's the comment I would that yeah. what you called for is actually beginning, has begun to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're quite right. Uh, Tunde Kelani tried something during uh, uh, the festival. We actually decided to take the cinema out, you know, the way it used to be open air something. And he got a projector, just like the old times. And we had this festival of Nigerian films, including his own. Went to Agege, Mushi. Uh, that was when Fashola was there, who supported the whole idea. And making uh, the cinema part and parcel of their lives, of, you know, of human lives, it's common commerce, like, uh, almost like turning it to Onisha market literature, in which you go to the kiosk and you read something, and they read another one. Yes, something like that, I think, has to happen and should be assisted as much as possible by institutions we believe in that act of dissemination. There's, a, there's an episode that uh, takes place in uh, somewhere around 1942 in, uh, in Ishara. Uh, in that episode, there's uh, an eight-year-old who wakes up early before dawn to find his grandfather leaning above him, a light in his hand. And the grandfather says, uh, son, uh, are you awake? And the, and the son says, I am. And the grandfather says, go outside. There's a pail of water. I've left a, I've left a pail of water in the yard for you. And as a, as a young boy gets up, he notices that there are two figures in the room. And as he leaves to go outside, he notices that between the two figures, there are some clay dishes mm -hmm. and there are some uh, other implements. And as he goes outside, he takes a wash. He's shivering, the sense of premonition about what's about to happen. And I bring up that episode because it's my intention to steal it for film. And it's an episode from Ake. I was wanted to declare it here in front of everyone that this is my intention to steal that particular episode from your members because it's, so, it's, it's more dramatic than some of the stuff that you've staged and it's taken from real life. So I wanted to say thank you for that and thank you for your work. I hope that was largely information and comment. And comment. Yes, yes. <laughs> As everybody said, thank you very much for this eloquent uh, journey you've taken all of us on through the importance of arts in our contemporary society. So, uh, I've been to the same lake in Salvador. They call it Chica de Tororo. And I was curiously enough there with a journalist friend. I befriended a Yoruba journalist there um, who was astonished that I was interested in the Orisha. And as we went to the football stadium, which is right by the, the lake, he was astonished by how beautiful the Orisha were. And he was a bit sad um, that these things were celebrated. And he was a Pentecostal Christian. I should preface it by saying that. After we had seen it, he actually agreed to go with me to a candomblé ceremony the same night. And this is someone who back home would never in a million years go with me to see a babalao. Um, and I'd, I'd say that to buttress your point, but then also ask that if this artistic expression can create that type of transformation, both within society and also within a human being, in, uh, in light of the comments you made at the beginning of, last, uh, of yesterday's lecture about the hundred shrines that were destroyed in the unnamed town, I wonder, is, do you think there's a possibility or, or any likelihood that Nollywood could be used for a similar type of effect back home in Nigeria, in the same way that the Brazilians were able to use uh, this lake to demonstrate the beauty and almost kind of transcendence of uh, Orisha traditions. Mm. Yes, there's a question at so the end the, of it somewhere. Mm. Yes, mm. Uh, some of it. Mm. is mm -hmm. playing the same redemptive role mm -hmm. of um, uh, informing mm -hmm. and addressing mm -hmm. the population mm -hmm. about indigenous religions yeah. and. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, I don't dismiss uh, that thing called Nollywood. If we just put the name aside, which I can never be reconciled to, it's just impossible. Uh, I made no bones about that. But as an instrument, it's absolutely formidable. <coughs> and um, the fact that it's the, the, those who participate actually see themselves, and this is very important, they become quite serious. At the beginning, it was... Uh, they were more interested in appearing in Cannes with uh, very 
low-grade uh, films, but now the films which go to festivals, including Cannes, they are films which we need not be ashamed of. But that tag, I think, is a huge drawback, and I see no harm at all in changing it. It's against, you know, knocking off against the wall, I know, but I'll continue to say my own, as we say in Nigeria, that it's a burden, it's an albatross, uh, it uh, detracts from the product, from the quality, from even curiosity. Curiosity, an outsider. He has Nollywood, he already knows what kind of, it's tagged permanently so that new seniors have to fight to extricate their work from that tag. And for me, this is unfair, very unjust to them. It is very short-sighted to have, you know, to picked on that uh, unimaginative, imitative thing, including those mimic spin-offs, Gollywood. Uh, there's Kenny Wood now in Zimbabwe or Kenya. I mean, I don't know, where will it end? Uh, very soon, it'll be Wallywood. Yeah? Horror, horrors of horrors. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. Thank you for this uh, fantastic presentation. I am so happy that you mentioned Usman Semben and Dakar 66 because I was present in Dakar in 66 and I've interviewed Semben on a number of occasions since then. I am curious to know what about, about what content of Semben and what style do you feel is very, very important in the 21st century? Yes, as I said, I got that. As, as I said, I mentioned Sembena, first of all, uh, because he's able to literally make something out of nothing. Uh, he's proved it again and again. Anybody who knows, uh, familiar with the way he worked and how he used to get his resources to even start work on a film and manage it and so on, we're quite impressed. He, he, it was quite an achievement and it was a pioneer on so many levels. Now, in addition to that, however, he, well, he did not hesitate to bite the hand that fed him. Senghor thought he could box him in by supporting, by giving funds to him for him. He went ahead and made Hala, where he satirized uh, my good friend Senghor <laughs> to, to no end. And, uh, and Semene always uh, decided, suited the style to the film, to the subject. His style, for instance, in Hala, was very different from Chedo, which dealt with this cruel phase of Islamization in the area. So it is that adaptability, I think, which creative people should, uh, uh, should cultivate. Um, the, uh, Kelani is doing something right now, for instance, uh, and along a certain line, which is very different from what he used to do before, just as there is, it came out of a discussion which I had with him, because he was having problems and so on. And by the time we finished speaking, he said something, I'm going to try this, in this time, just work. And right now, he's actually shooting along the lines of what came out of our discussion. So I think artists should be adaptable. They shouldn't try and be Sembene, but should pick from Sembene what they need for any particular subject. That's what I would recommend. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for um, your talk. Uh, I'm sort of really, uh, I'm overwhelmed right now in a really positive way. Um, I get, but I guess my question is, I'm kind of confused. I don't want to be the oversensitive one in the room, so I'm going to try to say this differently. Um, I, I think sometimes bad art is practice, it's practice ground. I think a lot of young people are trying to practice and trying to, they're really hungry for a particular sort of transformation. And, and they're just sort of putting whatever they can out there. So I don't want to, I don't want to quarantine. Uh, I guess my question is, is like, how do we recognize that hunger that, that those filmmakers do have, that desire, and how do we talk about the fact that it's not being quenched by other forms? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, how do we honor the desire to be innovative, experimental, 
mm. and to try out things that don't work out and mm -hmm. so on by the younger filmmakers? Oh, the answer to that is very simple. You begin by being ready to fail, okay? And then you pick yourself up, you learn from the lessons of your last experiment, and by that time, you are no longer experimenting. Uh, that's the only recommendation which I can make, if he translated you quite correctly. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time, and unfortunately, um, this is the third and final um, of Wally Shohinka's Richard Cohen lectures. I'm, I've seen many faces have been here for three days in a row, and I'm sure you share with me uh, enormous pleasure and admiration for um, the brilliance of my dear friend, Wally Shoenka. Thank you for honoring us with your Thank presence. You. With your Thank, you Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.